queen conceived without original sin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It was a day of quiet victory in the war-torn pontificate of Blessed Pius IX. That glorious Pope, who reigned for 32 years and died four years short of his 90th birthday, was only a tiny babe when the fray began. He was born in 1792, on the 13th of May, a day which divine providence has always given to the Mother of God. In ancient times, May 13th was the feast of Our Lady, Queen of Martyrs, for so the Pantheon was renamed and consecrated in Rome. It was the original All Saints Day. In our dark times, which have seen and will yet see martyrs by the millions, May 13th is the day on which the Blessed Virgin came with her urgent message for the children of Fatima. The future Pope was only a few months old when France, eldest daughter of the Church, murdered its king and plunged all Europe into a long century of revolutionary bloodshed, which ushered in the world we have today, a world which acknowledges no king, least of all Christ the King. When Pius IX began his pontificate, he greeted revolutionary Europe with a fatherly smile. The only response he got was treachery. He soon had open rebellion in the pontifical states. He saw his closest ministers cut down in the streets of Rome. And only two years after taking the tiara, he had to flee the eternal city, which descended into anarchy. The Pope returned to Rome after two years' exile, but it was no triumphant home homecoming. The state of affairs was now clear to everyone. There was not one corner of formerly Catholic Europe which did not dare to violate the rights of Holy Mother Church. The saintly Pope confided all his trials to the Blessed Virgin. He had been consecrated to this Holy Queen from the day of his birth, and the day came when he was ready to grant her one of her greatest victories against the evils of modern times. The date, December 8, 1864. If you know your history of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, you may be wondering if I have my dates wrong. But I do mean December 8, 1864, 10th anniversary of the solemn definition of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was on this occasion that Blessed Pius IX published his encyclical Quanta Cura, and his famous syllabus, syllabus of errors, condemning the false opinions of the modern era. The date, of course, was not chosen by chance. In fact, the Pope had, want, had wanted originally to publish this encyclical 10 years earlier and to include the definition of the Immaculate Conception at the heart of the document. It was the Pope's firm position that any condemnation of the errors of the modern world must also acknowledge the power of her who brings the victory against all error, as the Church has always sung in her liturgy, Rejoice, O Virgin Mary, thou alone hast destroyed all heresies throughout the world. And in the words of the psalmist, with thy comeliness and thy beauty set out, proceed prosperously and reign. Mary is the mother of God. She is full of grace and the mediatrix of all gracious graces, and she is our queen. This declaration of Mary's queenship comes as no surprise to any of you. After all, it has been the theme of this entire novena, which we conclude tonight in considering the invocation, Queen Conceived, Without Original Sin. A month ago, we paid homage to Christ our King. Mary is the mother of that King. She is the Queen Mother 
of the son of David prefigured in the Old Testament. She surpasses all the other saints in her fullness of grace and the power of her intercession. Surely this is enough to merit for her the title of queen, which tradition has always applied to her. But so far we have spoken of no more than a metaphorical queenship, a queenship of honor and preeminence. The lion is called the king of the jungle, but he exercises no real authority over the other animals. What shall we say of our blessed lady? Is she our queen in the proper sense? And does she exercise sovereign rights over us? Tonight, I answer that question with a resounding yes. And I invite you to meditate for a moment on the beautiful explanation. When Pope Pius XI instituted the Feast of Christ the King, he declared that on that day all Christians should kneel before the Blessed Sacrament exposed and pronounce the consecration of the human race to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This consecration to the Sacred Heart underlines the meaning of the Feast of Christ the King. By the devotion to the Sacred Heart, we honor the mystery of a God who became man in order to love us as a man loves, and to suffer for us as only a man can suffer. God alone can be said to be king over the created world without any qualification. And Jesus Christ is true God, therefore he is true king. But what the feast teaches us is that Jesus Christ, even as a man, merits the title of king. And this is true for three reasons. First of all, the man, Christ Jesus, is substantially united to a divine person the second person of the Blessed Trinity, such that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, human and divine. That man is a person who must be acknowledged by the entire universe as king. Secondly, the man Christ Jesus is full of grace. As God, his grace is infinite. He is grace itself. And as man, he is the source of all graces, Bestowed on, the poor, bestowed on the poor children of Eve, such that no man may ever see the face of God except through him. <coughs> Finally, the man Christ Jesus has a kingship which he earned by his victory over death on the cross. As the apostle says, for which cause God hath exalted him and hath given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The Blessed Virgin Mary takes part in this threefold royalty of the humanity of Jesus Christ in a manner more exalted than that of all the other saints, even though all saints are said to reign with Christ. She gave her human nature to the second person of the Trinity, and the king of the universe deigned to be governed by her during his life on earth. How can any other man dare to challenge her authority? She is full of grace from the first moment of her conception, and Christ has never given and will never give any of the graces of his redemption except through her. The victory of Christ on Calvary was her victory as well. When our Lord was scourged, she felt every blow. And when he was nailed to the cross, she looked upon her son and made his pain her own. But when the soldier pierced our Lord's side with a lance, he was already dead. The pain of that blow was reserved for Mary alone, as Simeon had predicted Thy soul, too, a sword shall pierce. Our victorious Lord did not leave his sacred humanity behind when he returned to heaven. And it was his will that his mother should reign with him, body and soul, in heaven. All the other saints reign with him by adoption. Mary reigns with him 
by right of blood. If then Mary is our queen in the proper sense, if she participates really and physically in the kingship of her son, it follows that we are her subjects and she exercises rights over us. And of the many titles which tradition gives to her in her litany, at the close of our novena, we reflect on one in particular, queen conceived without original sin. St. Francis de Sales paved the way for the papal definition, which would come 300 years later, when he wrote, God destined for his most holy mother a favor worthy of the love of a son, who being all wise, almighty, and all good, wished to prepare a mother to his liking. And therefore he willed his redemption to be applied to her after the manner of a preserving remedy so that the sin which was spreading from generation to generation should not reach her. She then was so excellently redeemed that though when the time came, the torrent of original iniquity rushed to pour its unhappy waves over her conception with as much impetuosity as it had done on the other daughters of Adam. Yet when it reached there, it passed not beyond but stopped, as once did the Jordan in the time of Joshua, and for the same reason. For this river held its stream in reverence for the passage of the Ark of Alliance, and so original sin drew back its waters, revering and dreading the presence of the true tabernacle of the eternal alliance. This son of eternal love thus clothed his mother in gilded clothing surrounded with variety, that she might be the queen of his right hand. The Blessed Virgin Mary could not have been, at any moment of her existence, an enemy of God. She was to give God her own human nature, and she was to bear God and to rule with God. This is indeed a new kind of queen mother. She is not merely the mother of a boy who became king. She is the mother of one who is king from all eternity and who willed that his kingdom should come on earth as in heaven, through her. What better patroness for our nation, which recognizes no king, but is so desperately in need of a queen who has no part in sin and is so powerful in protecting her subjects from the relentless attacks of the forces of hell. O Mary, by the merits of thy son, king and sovereign priest, I acknowledge thee, to be the queen of the universe. Exercise over me all thy sovereign rights. Queen conceived without original sin, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.